Hey, everybody. This is Tim Ash, president of the Vermont State Senate. It's Wednesday, May 27th, here with my daily update on Vermont's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Really delighted today to have Pablo Bose, UVM professor of geography and director of the Global and Regional Studies program, with us to talk about how COVID has impacted certain populations here in Vermont, especially those who are new Americans or immigrants who uh, sometimes we might, we might not be thinking that they might be differently impacted, but obviously with the various barriers they face uh, coming to Vermont and making their life here, there are unique challenges that they may face as a result of employment, tax, transportation, you name it. So, Professor, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Now, before we get into the Vermont context, um, for people all around the state watching, they hear a uh, professor of geography, which doesn't often translate much more than maps to many people who have not, yeah. who, who maybe don't follow um, modern geogra geography sort of practices and how it's uh, applied in the real, you know, in the, uh, out in the field. Uh, and I know you do a lot of work internationally. Uh, tell us a little bit uh, about what, what your area of emphasis is, your expertise, uh, and you told me a little bit about some work you've been doing with a refugee camp in Bangladesh. Maybe you could just tell a little bit about how um, you've recently experienced their uh, impact that they've faced by COVID. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I, I work in geography. I'm very uh, interested in all kinds of subjects. Broadly speaking, I study migration in cities. Um, so I look at uh, two sides of this. On the one hand, usually internationally, I've been looking at why people get forced out of the places that they live in um, by wars, by persecution, conflict, by environmental changes, things like that. And on this side, uh, I tend to look a lot at resettlement. So people coming in, um, I've looked at a resettlement in North America, in Europe. Um, I'm particularly interested in places like Vermont. So looking at um, when people come not to the big metropolitan cities, uh, the New Yorks and the Londons uh, and the Parises, but instead the, the Burlingtons and Iowa City and uh, Lincoln, Nebraska and places like that. And I've also looked at that elsewhere. Uh, another part of my work really is on kind of environmental risk, um, as I mentioned. And so that's where some of the COVID stuff has come in. So I'm actually working with a couple of colleagues here at UVM and with colleagues in other parts of the world to look at refugee camps and look at how they're facing these kinds of uh, multiple uh, issues. So, you know, we're rightly uh, concerned about the spread of uh, COVID here, but imagine what it's like if you are in a tightly packed refugee camp um, with a lack of uh, sanitation, a lack of medical facilities, et cetera. And so, as I was mentioning, uh, one of the world's largest camps is uh, a place called Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh, which uh, houses many of the um, over 700,000 people who were forced to flee from um, Burma and came to Bangladesh. And so there they are in this camp. They've been in this camp already for several years now. They're trying desperately to think through, okay, what's going to happen if COVID uh, gets diagnosed? And they've had a couple of these cases. Next thing they know, they've got a super cyclone, biggest one in 20 years, bearing down on them from the Bay of Bengal. And as I'm talking to people in the camp, they're telling me that where they stored all of their supplies up on top of one of these warehouses got overrun by monkeys who were literally not allowing them to enter the camp. Luckily, uh, the cyclone passed that, though it devastated my uh, town I was born in, uh, in Calcutta in uh, India. Um, now, I believe there was also an earthquake um, that hit. So these places are sort of um, hit by, by multiple things. And in a less dramatic fashion, that's a lot of what, you know, we've been seeing in places like Vermont and other, other areas, a, whether a natural disaster or a health disaster, what you experience is very much determined by who you are and what your kind of uh, socioeconomic position is. Well, before we turn to Vermont, can you just restate how many, because I think a lot of people hear refugee camp, and first of all, they think it's te very temporary. We know many refugee yeah. camps are far from temporary. They're multi-generational. They have, people have nowhere to go, to go to, especially when 
you know, nations like ours have closed the doors at this point uh, almost entirely. But how many people are in the refugee camp that you just described? So in that one, Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh, that's 800,000. Um, 800,000. 800,000 people, right? The, the three that we are, um, this project that I'm doing with um, Kelsey Gleason and um, Brendan Fisher here at UVM uh, is actually looking at the three largest, which is Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh, um, uh, the Dadaab complex in Kenya, which is five camps. It's the largest in the world. That has over a million people. And uh, a smaller one in Jordan called Zatari, but by smaller, it's still more than 200,000 people. Well, maybe um, that's it. That might be a good segue to Vermont, because I believe the Kenyan refugee camp that you just described, many of the people who are in Vermont now uh, have actually were born in that camp or passed through at some point. Is that, is that, am I right? I, I'm that, pretty that sure. That is I'm correct. Right. Yeah, that uh, a number of the folks um, who have come here, you know, the largest refugee population we have, and, and you're quite right, you know, you have different kinds of refugee populations. There's ones who get displaced by a, uh, a short, horrific um, set of events. Um, you know, many of the, the people who, who've come here from Bosnia, for example. Um, and then there are others who not only were displaced violently, but then were sort of stuck in camps. Um, so the largest population we have here, um, uh, their origin is Bhutan. And for many of our, our neighbors who come from Bhutan, um, their parents or grandparents uh, were stuck in those camps for 10, 20 years. So this sort of incidence of kind of protracted stay is um, more and more common. You know, the number of refugees worldwide has doubled from 2010. There was about 45 million people who were displaced. Not all were refugees. In 2010, we're over 70 million now. And as you said, not only in the U.S., but worldwide, um, we've moved in the opposite direction to actually stop uh, people from entering rather than um, kind of looking at, well, how do we create solutions out of this? Well, it certainly puts uh, in perspective the journey that many people took before they uh, arrived in Vermont. So, so let's, let's shift uh, and get to the heart of uh, our, fo our focus here. In terms of the impact of COVID-19, we know that it's caused you know, a massive amount of stress and anxiety for everybody. It has been a public health emergency, which Vermont has handled quite well uh, relative to other states an economic crisis uh, as a result of effectively shutting down the economy in service of public health. So everyone's experiencing a lot of pain right now. And uh, even those who are still employed have been under a tremendous amount of stress. Uh, people wondering if jobs are going to still exist several months from now, what's going to reopen, kids going through school who you know, have had their whole worlds kind of flipped upside down. How does this impact Vermont's new American community and immigrants differently if it does? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So one, I, I want to um, emphasize something you said that, you know, of course, this is affecting everybody. Um, uh, you know, one um, sort of meme that I saw, you know, kind of tossed around is people saying that we're not all in the same boat, we're in the same storm, and that we're in different boats in that storm. And I think that that's something that I've seen uh, very much amongst the new American community. Um, so one big impact is in the types of industries that have been affected right away. Many of the people who come here, so just really quickly saying something about what the experience of resettling here is for a, a number of people. You know, you're, you're coming out, sometimes you're coming out of a situation um, more directly, but a lot of times, as we were saying, people are stuck in camps for a long time. They come here and you have a fairly small window of time to to get up and running, right? You have uh, maybe four, maybe eight months of direct support from the federal government. Um, and then you work with the agencies here. You work with the Vermont, sorry, it's not called VRP anymore. It's the US Committee on Refugees and Immigrants Vermont. They really work with you in the first eight months. And then after that, eight months to the first year. And then after that, it's um, other agencies. The major one that I work with quite a bit is called the Association of Africans Living in Vermont. Uh, ALV, but it actually works with people all across the board. Its biggest number of clients are actually Bhutanese. Hmm. Um, but the emphasis is on get a job right away. Now, there's a bigger sort of issue around that about like whether or not people are being matched up to the skills they have, et cetera. 
But the reality is if you are going to get a job right away, what are those jobs going to be like? They're going to be in the hospitality industry. They're going to be in hotels. They're going to be in, you know, food services. Um, they're going to be in manufacturing. You know, we've got some great local manufacturers here, um, great local industries that have um, had a, a pretty solid history of employing um, new Americans. So, you know, when the shutdown happened, a lot of them got, got thrown out of work right away. So what we're talking about is people who are really dependent on a lot of those jobs, who are dependent on, um, you know, food support. Uh, and, you know, we've seen the utilization of different kinds of um, these social services by uh, a lot of these new Americans. Again, there are you know, significant differences within the new American communities based on how long people have been here. So, you know, it's not as though lots of people in the Bosnian communities or Vietnamese community are utilizing these services. But for those who have come in the last, say, 10 years, um, there was a pretty quick pivot made by organizations like ALV, VRP, but also a lot of the other um, you know, places around campus, like, I'm oh, sorry, around um, Vermont, um, the food shelf, um, you know, uh, Chittenden uh, County, uh, was the, the feeding Chittenden? Sorry, I can't Feeding Chittenden, yeah, the yeah, new, former Chittenden. Chittenden emergency food shelf, but feeding right. Chittenden is their new. Chittenden, uh, the schools, um, you know, we've seen a, a pivoting. So there's been a coming together to try and figure out sort of triaging, so what do we do? Which are the communities that are the most in need? not only of food, but of, I don't know, diapers or, you know, other emergency supplies, things like that. Because among the challenges that newcomers face, they're the ones that you would expect, people not speaking English, right? But one of the big things that we do is provide English classes. So how do you do that if they're going to be remote? How do people know how to get help if they can't you know, speak the language? Well, and that's, that's one of the things I've been, I've been quite... Uh it's left a deep impression on me is it's, you know, under normal circumstances, when we're not in a state of emergency, making sure that information is translated into the first language of people, whether it's for accessing healthcare or accessing social service safety net programs, or even utilizing uh, workplace protections or benefits. Uh, it's hard enough to have all of the languages uh, you know, have the information presented in those uh, first languages. In yeah. this case, in this case, because everything was happening so fast and we were doing emergency response to an emergency situation in a hundred different ways, it's not as if we already had all of the materials available to quickly communicate uh, how people could meet their basic needs. I don't know if you think we've responded quickly and effectively or if it's been a struggle or how you've, you've seen that. I think it's been a struggle, but I also think that there's been a tremendous step up um, by um, certain uh, organizations. Again, you know, one of the things that I've always um, been very impressed with in Vermont is the kind of vibrant uh, civil society sector. So, you know, Spectrum, um, the Multicultural Youth Program, I think that Spectrum's Multicultural Youth Program yeah, right. um, partnered with USCRI to translate, you know, do a, a ton of translations um, of different things, of sort of emergency procedures. How do you understand this guidance that's coming out from the state? How do you, you know, those kinds of things. Translating it not just literally, but sort of into practice. Um, I've seen also, you know, what uh, the schools have been, the school districts have been pretty amazing. Winooski and uh, South Burlington, Burlington are the ones where you see sort of the, especially Burlington and Winooski, some of the largest groups of um, new American students. And so you've seen there, there's something called a homeschool liaison program. These are uh, educators from the uh, refugee communities. They are amazing. They are absolutely amazing. And they have been uh, heavily relied upon, you know, since I've lived here, certainly, but they have become even more pivotal in this particular moment. Um, in providing that bridge over things like, so, okay, we're all teaching remote or learning remotely now. Um, how does my kid get a learning packet? Um, right. Food, you know, given the absolute centrality that the food districts have, I mean, the school districts have pl 
played in providing food access. Um, you know, that kind of stuff needing to, to get out, um, you know, some of the PTAs, Parent Teacher Associations, PTOs, um, you know, them also relying on the homeschool liaisons to, to kind of bridge those gaps. So those kinds of things, um, could it be better? Sure, but I think that there's some some good efforts. Yeah, I think I've been watching, I think alongside you, some of the same dynamics play out. And I think it's, um, we take for granted that, for instance, yesterday, um, they shut down the Beltline in Burlington, between Burlington and Colchester, so people could uh, receive food packages. I take for granted that I saw that on 10 different news sources and on Front Porch Forum and a variety of places, but some of the people who need the resources the most uh, may not be plugged into any of those uh, f forms of receiving information. And so it's been up to these kind of liaisons to be making sure that the information gets out to people who aren't connected in the same way. That and I'm really in. organizations like ALV, I, I'm always really impressed by ALV and US, USCRI, but they've been, you know, I have seen ALV, they are delivering food and supplies to what, 50, 60 families um, and really acting as a lifeline. Uh, I've seen them, you know, again, as I said, I work with them pretty uh, closely and my wife actually uh, runs the refugee agriculture program. And it's been amazing for me to see on the one hand, you know, you're, you're sitting there going, how are you gonna run a greenhouse when you have 70 families and, you know, hundreds of farmers how are you going to do this so that it's um, socially distanced, people are sterilizing and, you know, all the rest of it. How are you going to then open up the farm? And, you know, I watched the last month as they did it. They managed it. And, you know, I went for a bike ride yesterday and I was going by the, the farm down at Ethan Allen by the Beltline. And, and my wife said, oh, uh, you know, what does it look like down there? And I looked down there and there's there were tons of people down there. Everybody was distanced. Everybody was masked. You know, they, they did it. So that was really um, pretty, uh, it's been amazing to me as not just because of this pandemic, but I've always been so um, kind of amazed and inspired by uh, a number of our, by the new arrivals, by what it is that they're able to do. And as one person said to me the other day, you know, I've been through a lot already. Um, and not that they want to be going through this, but you know, they have a certain kind of resilience that, you know, I certainly don't feel like I have. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you. The, the journey they've taken to come to our country is, is often poorly understood mm -hmm. because it's not as if um, people walk around with a note explaining all the hardships they've faced. But uh, for those of us who've had the security and comfort of being born in the U.S. and growing up here, it's obviously a a completely different uh, experience uh, to grow up in, uh, to become an adult in. And I think you're, you're right. The fact that um, the combination of elements, both the resilience of the new American populations themselves, all of the organizations who step up to support them, the fact that uh, in and around town, uh, I'm seeing the same level of uh, mask wearing and social distancing is a sign that communication has, um, despite its difficulties, really been emphasized and that um, people have been educated on why we're all doing these things. So we've got a wrap. I wanna thank you, uh, Professor Bose. Your, your work you do is really, uh, it's not just interesting, but really remarkable and helps give us not just an insight uh, into many of our neighbors, but ideas for how we can uh, help them fulfill their potential, which frankly is in all of our interests, both uh, on a community basis, but also as uh, valued contributors to our workforce. And hopefully sometime soon we can chat again, uh, looking back and see what lessons have been learned that can help us moving forward. So thank you so much for all the work you do Absolutely. and for, for joining us. Thank you for having me. And for everyone else watching, I want to thank you for tuning in. I will see you uh, tomorrow at 530, and I hope you continue to do whatever you can to stay safe. Thanks.